Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight in all of the various ways that you are joining us. I'm Brendan Fay. I'm a faculty member in art and design here at Eastern Michigan. Um, and it is my distinct personal and professional pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Rebecca Zurier. Dr. Zurier is an associate professor of history of art at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, where she's also a part of the program in American culture. And where she was, through no fault of her own, don't hold it against her, one of my own very first undergraduate instructors in the field of art history. Professor Zurier is a leading scholar of the Ashcan School of American Painters and of the broader visual and social culture and context of early 20th century modern art in the United States. That includes her important work on the illustrated radical magazine, The Masses. She also lives a not so secret double life, at least in my opinion, as a historian of pop art with a particular interest in its domestic and international reception. Her book, Picturing the City, Urban Vision and the Ashcan School was a Smithsonian, Amer uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum Charles Eldridge Prize winner and a College Art Association Maury Award finalist. I'm particularly fond of its chapter on George Bellows, after which I've never been able to hear or use the word kids in quite the same way again. She had previously curated the exhibition Metropolitan Lives, the Ashcan Artists and their New York for the National Museum of American Art. And its accompanying catalog won the College Association Alfred H. Barr Award, which honors distinguished museum scholarship. I have long admired the ways that Dr. Zurier brings her research and curatorial interests into her teaching, approaching, approaching both artifacts and exhibitions as vital tools for teaching and learning. Her partnership with the Toledo Museum of Art in 2012 and 2013, when she offered a seminar that culminated in a student curated Bellows exhibition at the museum is a particularly striking example, but it's an approach that she's able to deploy across topics and across scales. From her long running seminars on the art and culture of Detroit, part of what brings us all together tonight, to her courses on the 19th and 20th century United States, to a little more recently, her collaborative teaching on art and the Americas, broadly understood. On a personal level, I'd like to note that a few years back, I had the opportunity to deliver Dr. Zurier's uh, American Century course while she was away on research leave at the University of Michigan. It was like having the keys handed over to a well-constructed and beautifully maintained cog. I learned a tremendous amount from her course design, from her approach to that course, from her content, in ways that still, on a daily basis, shape my own teaching of modern art and the experiences of my students at Eastern Michigan today. I hope you all join me in please welcoming Dr. Rebecca Zuri. Thank you. Yeah, it 
thank you, everybody in the room and out there um, for a chance to get together and talk about art in Detroit, which is something I like to do. And thank you to Greg Tom for putting up with all of this, you know, to keep multiple audiences going. And Brendan, that was such a nice introduction from somebody who cares a lot about teaching and students and art. And yeah, you've been there. So this is good. And now we have students here too. So this is extra good. Okay. And the other thank you goes to Julia Myers, who I think is out there in Zoom world. And it's thanks to her um, incredible scholarship in all these years of working on that exhibit of Harold Neal and African American artists in Detroit that she has hunted the material and talked to the people and really helped us understand what was on people's minds and what they were making in a way that we can gather and go see. Um, so I hope people who haven't seen the exhibit will and those who already have might want to go back in light of what we're going to be talking about today. Okay. Um, perhaps some of the people in the audience will know people who saw the murals I'm talking about when they were new, which is great because I'm still researching them. Maybe some of you will know some of the people who were involved in the organizations that sponsored these murals or people who saw them on the street or who were part of the youth organizations that were, um, who were around these murals. Some of you might be able to identify some of the portraits of people in the murals, which would also be great to know. Um, students and other people coming to this material for the first time are going to have questions. I hope that will help the project grow, including like what was under the green bar on that slide, like three seconds. We can do that. We can go back and look at pictures if people want to know more about some of them. I'm planning to talk for about 45 minutes. That's fine. That's yeah. Fine. Okay. So the artists I'm going to be discussing today and those featured in the exhibit, Harold Neal and Detroit African-American artists were concerned, all concerned with some of the same big questions. How could art function politically and serve the people, more specifically black Americans? Could art share aims with the black arts and the black power movements to work toward justice and showcase black achievement while creating an aesthetic sometimes independent of white culture. They shared a call for figurative art for depicting the black body at a time when modernism's avant-garde had long since moved in other directions. Some of these same artists featured in the um, exhibition up in the gallery also worked on the creation of the wall of pride that you see down here. That's one of the murals I'm going to be talking about. And in the photo, um, that's Henry King or Henri, if anyone knows how he pronounced his name, I'd love to know. That's him on the left and Harold Neal on the right in 1962. And King became one of the people who collaborated on the wall of pride that you see down below, um, which was painted near 12th and Claremont in Detroit in summer 1968. Those are the connections between this talk and that exhibit but there are important differences between Neil's chosen medium of easel painting, what you see him doing there, and murals painted on walls outdoors on the street, which is what we see here. Murals are both site-specific and part of everyday urban space. They're a form of public art, and I'm interested in understanding how they operated within and to create publics in Detroit in the 1960s and 70s in neighborhoods that were far removed from the more iconic downtown that we see in the postcard and that always was on postcards at that time. Murals in black neighborhoods can be seen as what the sociologist Mary Patillo terms a public act of demanding visibility. That's from her. As we'll see, although black power murals have been painted in many cities since the 1960s and 70s, Detroit's were among the first and their location and their dates are very specific to Detroit's history. So let's begin with some Detroit history. As smoke cleared after the events that devastated swaths of Detroit's majority African-American neighborhoods in July, 1967, 
Detroiters debated what had happened. Was it a riot, a rebellion, a revolt, or an uprising? Investigators pinpointed when and where it originated. Early on July 23rd, police raided a blind pig or illegal after hours club on 12th Street near Claremont in Detroit. As the arrested people were herded into vans, one onlooker threw a brick or a bottle and crowds rushed in. Within a day, reports of looting, arson and gunfire were coming from the city's east side. And that's, um, okay, so here's 12th and Claremont. Here's our unofficial dividing line in Detroit, Woodward Avenue, we'll keep seeing that. So try to orient yourself. But within a day, there was arson over here in this red area on the east side as well. Okay, the chaos expanded on the west side. The violence heightened as the Michigan National Guard were called in. Among the casualties was four-year-old Tanya Blanding, a little girl who was shot with 50 caliber bullets from a National Guard tank that had fired toward a flash of light, some, which was actually someone lighting a cigarette in the family apartment overlooking 12th and Euclid. Okay. That incident would later inspire the painting you see by Harold Neal. Responding to a request from the governor, President Lyndon Johnson ordered the dispatch of two US military divisions. They eventually succeeded in quieting the streets. Over the course of five days, 43 people died, hundreds more were injured, over 7,000 were arrested, and acres of property were destroyed. Those who sought to explain why this happened in what was supposed to be a booming model city, Detroit in the 1960s, cited high unemployment and dropout rates among black youth, longstanding police brutality targeting black Detroiters, and discrimination by landlords and storekeepers who charged black customers exorbitant rates. A few analysts pointed to the growing president presence of radical black power groups in the city. The Kerner Commission, a national group, a national commission, later offered a sweeping systemic verdict, verdict on the disturbances that had shaken cities from Newark to Los Angeles that year. The, in, the commission wrote, our nation is moving toward two societies, separate and unequal. That term of separation informs the section on Detroit's history and geography that comes next. Detroiters then and now have invoked the city's motto, we hope for better things, we will rise from the ashes. Both the city's 19th century seal on the left and it's up then the updated version on the city flag depict two female figures, one despairing as she points toward a city in flames. That's uh, over here or over here, red flames and the other pointing hopefully to, toward a new city on the rise. The phrase was coined after fire devastated the young city of Detroit back in 1805. Okay. In that fire's wake, Chief Justice Augustus Woodward devised a geometric master plan for the city that shaped future construction and still can be traced in the city's downtown. Through the middle would run a new central ar artery, Woodward Avenue. He named it humbly after himself, um, here's the river, here's Woodward Avenue, and you'll see the whole, the city was supposed to grow symmetrically on either side of Woodward. And if you look at the map of where the arson happened in 1967, you'll still see Woodward and you'll still see some of those grand diagonal boulevards um, spoking out from the river. So keep that in mind. Tonight, we'll examine another version of rising from the ashes in Detroit, three murals that were created in response to the events of 1967 in neighborhoods hit hardest by the conflagration. I interpret the murals in terms of their site or social geography, but also their placement on walls outdoors as a form of public art. Their lead artists, William Walker and Eugene Wade, who went by Ida, had recently worked on the celebrated Wall of Respect on the south side of Chicago. They were invited to Detroit by social and religious activist groups who sought to make a mark in the recovering city. Okay, while the 1967 uprising could be considered as what Fred Moten and Stefan O'Harney describe as claiming public space by undoing or disordering a city's racist structure, 
I'd argue that Detroit's black power murals contributed instead to a growing black counter public sphere that comes from Mabel O. Wilson and, and other thinkers, a sphere that eventually shaped the civic culture. The wall of dignity on Detroit's east side was com oh. here we go. Okay, we're still here. It was completed in spring 1968 in terms in time for the Midwest leg of the Poor People's March. The Wall of Pride marked the uprising's one year anniversary on the west side at Grace Episcopal Church near 12th and Claremont, and a set of religious themed murals were mounted across the facade of the Church of St. Bernard of Clairvaux across from the Wall of Dignity later in 68. My current research investigates how each of these murals drew from and spoke to its place in the city to contribute to the formation of Black public, public consciousness in a changing Detroit. By reclaiming walls built for an earlier city, they invited viewers to see themselves and their own neighborhoods within a history of struggle and accomplishment and imagine what the city's future could be. Detroit's geography of racial inequality developed long before 1967. The city's growth from French outposts on the River Straits, Detroit, to industrial powerhouse had always needed but offered limited rights to a growing population of African American workers. In the early 20th century, denied the opportunity to rent or purchase property. In most sections of the city, many Black Detroiters crowded into an area of older tenements known as the Black Bottom, near where the French had once farmed and European immigrants had then settled running north from the river on the east side of the city. This became an African-American city within a city, supported by residents who earned decent wages in the automobile industry. Its commercial district called Paradise Valley emerged as a mecca of black entertainment, but also of black owned businesses and professional offices. Urban renewal destroyed most of the Black Bottom and Paradise Valley neighborhood in the late 50s. By then, as relocation to the suburbs by both industry and white workers quickened, members of Detroit's middle class were purchasing substantial homes on the city's west side in what had been a Jewish neighborhood. The Jewish owned businesses and rental property that remained there would later become targets during the uprising in 1967. Among the neighborhood's new landmarks were the houses where Motown produced its hit records the new Bethel Baptist Church, where the Reverend E.L. Franklin emerged as a charismatic figure in the civil rights movement, and the Central Congregational Church, led by Franklin's rival, the influential Black Christian nationalist, Reverend Albert Clegg, who you see on the right. When newcomers crowded into the West Side, single family houses were divided into cramped apartments and a new vice district emerged. Some of the established Black middle class relocated further north. On the east side, poor Detroiters moved into sections then occupied by European immigrants who worked in the factories and had founded the area's abundance of Catholic churches and schools. Police who routinely cruised these districts were accused of harassing black youth who gathered on street corners there. So remember those churches, they'll be part of our story. Such acts of discrimination helped galvanize developments in black political and cultural organizations in the 1960s, as the city's African American population approached 40% of the total. Detroit's history of left and labor activism played a role in the formation of radical black nationalist groups, some of which were calling for separatism. When Clegg renamed his church the Shrine of the Black Madonna, he announced a new vision epitomized by the altarpiece you see in the photo, showing Mary and Jesus as a black mother and child. Clegg's sermon instructed congregants in how to view the painting. He said, we don't really need a sermon this morning. We could just sit here and look at the Black Madonna and marvel that we've come so far, end quote. In some ways, the murals painted on walls outdoors the following year would continue that idea of looking as transformative and empowering, but they took it to the streets. Yeah. The Wall of Dignity was painted on the east side on an abandoned commercial building two blocks from where, during the uprising a year earlier, a firefighter had been killed while attempting to put out an arson blaze. To the north at Mack Avenue were massive automobile factories. Sessa, 
the Coalition of East Side Churches for Social Action had been working in this district for years and earlier in 1967 had hired Frank Ditto, that's the guy in the diamond pattern shirt in the photo on the lower right. Um, Ditto was a community organizer in Chicago. They hired him as director of a new entity in Detroit called the East Side Voice of Independent Detroit. Inspired by his work in Chicago with Martin Luther King and tactics from Saul Alinsky, who also was based in Chicago, Ditto established a newspaper called The Ghetto Speaks and local programs while seeking to both confront and work with Detroit's powers that be. His reliance on funding from both church and business organizations would eventually become a source of tension for everyone involved. Inspired by the wall of respect in Chicago, Detroit um, Ditto invited the artist Walker and Ida to Detroit. They brought with them panels painted by some of the other Chicago artists who'd worked on the wall of respect and then created many more paintings specifically for the site in Detroit. There it is. Within a few months, Walker and Ida expanded their project by transferring the panels onto a larger wall and supplemented them with both textual and pictorial additions painted directly onto the brick. The emphasis on portraits of what they called black heroes and sheroes was in step with calls at the time nationally, but also in the Michigan Chronicle, which still is a newspaper from the black community in Detroit. Um, Michigan Chronicle had published an editorial asking people to forget and cast aside the senseless worship of other cultures and standards. We must start now to create and honor our own heroes. We must create our own saints. We must canonize our own martyrs." End quote. Across the ground level, Walker inscribed the inscription Wall of Dignity to give the assemblage focus and surrounded the letters with brooding dashiki clad figures whose eyes engaged passers-by. Through this arrangement, the wall communicated with its viewers on multiple registers. The mural's location at ground level placed it within the space of daily urban life. As with Chicago's Wall of Respect, it functioned as a gallery of pieces in different media and artistic styles that contributed to a cumulative theme of Black achievement in which Walker and Ida themselves, as they worked out their painting in plain view of everybody in the neighborhood, served as examples of black excellence in the arts. The artists thought of their work as a gift to the community that would educate its viewers in black history and a history that included not only famous political leaders, but also artists. Here are some of the top panels. This is mostly Ida's work. Unlike the mural in Chicago, however, this project encompassed a historical na narrative that moved through time in panels along the top border from Pharaonic Egypt on the left through the establishment of kingdoms in Sub-Saharan Africa and replicas of Benin artworks from the 17th century, then from slavery through to the present. It juxtaposed portraits of leaders here, Mark, Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X were very prominent with anonymous figures of ordinary African-Americans. Walker incorporated text strategically to, and this is him talking, to assist the people who are less familiar with visual expression. So he was always thinking as a teacher. All of this served as a means of interpolation in text and image as seen in this panel with a quote from the poet Leroy Jones, later Baraka, calling all black people, come on in, thus attracting, teaching, but also creating a public. Response was so enthusiastic that a panel depicting Charlie Parker was quickly stolen from the wall. This can happen with public art, people interact. What happened to that panel and whether it might survive are among the mysteries I'd love to solve. Public art can function as a destination, but also part of the daily routine of people who go by. Readers who wrote into the newspaper, The Ghetto Speaks, referred to the mural as a ghetto museum, and they described their interactions with it. One wrote, the wall of dignity means race consciousness and pride of accomplishment. Every time I walk by the wall, I get a fierce, hot feeling in my chest, end quote. Others still speak of it as, quote, our wall, end quote. The wall also functioned as a local man landmark 
and a staging ground that brought it to the attention of a broader audience. Thousands of workers passed it every day on the bus lines going to the factories near Mack Avenue. The canny organizer Frank Ditto employed the wall to build support not only within the neighborhood, but also in the city and in national media. These photographs show some of the coverage of events staged at the wall. And if photographers were there, that's probably because there were press releases. Okay. Um, we see when the East Side Voice organized a youth model government organization that trained local high schoolers in politics, they held their first press conference at the wall. And Mrs. Rosa Parks, famous Detroiter, was guest of honor at that event. The organization's Youth Patrol Corps drilled and was photographed here. All these images were disseminated in news, on television, and through interpretive photo essays, many by African-American photographers. The Wall of Pride followed in summer 1967 with high hopes, but a different result that again connects to questions of sight and the social geography of Detroit's Black population. Painted on an end wall at Grace Episcopal Church, its vivid array of portraits overlooked the remains of what had been the urban corridor at the center of the conflagration on the west side. And the building where four-year-old Tanya Blanding had been shot stood just across the street from Grace Episcopal. The Detroit branch of the Black Panther Party soon moved next door to Grace Episcopal. So let's locate it. The church, that the church itself survived the destruction of the uprising may indicate the respect its ministers had earned through their social, so social outreach work in the surrounding community. This project originated with the artist William Walker, who noticed the prominent position of this, at that time, blank church wall, and he approached the clergy there Two young co-rectors, Arthur B. Williams, who was African-American, and Marshall W. Hunt, who was white, had each recently transferred to Detroit in hopes of serving a congregation in the heart of the struggle. They saw the proposed mural, in Arthur Williams' words, as a means of being part of what he called what was going on, end quote, among activists, while contributing to the reconstruction of the city. For this project, Walker and Ida enlisted the participation of local artists. Okay. You'll recognize the names of several from the Harold Neal exhibit, but evidently not Neal himself. Painting directly on the wall, they created a densely grouped history of powerful fighters and spokesmen, Shaka Zulu, as well as Nat Turner and W.E.B. Du Bois. And the reason I'm showing you this bad black and white photo is the, it's the only I've, one I've found that shows you the whole bottom range. So you can see Aretha Franklin on the left, and you can see Muhammad Ali on the right and Martin Luther King. At lower right also rose the black power fist. The controversy that surrounded this mural almost immediately reveals the complicated nature of the public on the west side of Detroit. The project was caught between speaking to a rising black power movement and the area's impoverished residents and the social makeup of the church's own congregation, which by that time was largely middle-class African-American families. They'd considered Grace Episcopal to be a bastion of respectability in Black Detroit. These are the people who had moved to, an er moved to this area earlier when it was still an up and coming Black neighborhood. They'd watched with dismay as what they saw as a lower element crowded in after the destruction of the Black Bottom. By 1967, many of the congregants at Grace Ep Episcopal had already left the neighborhood and commuted back for church events. While their lay leadership of the congregation, that was called the vestry, agreed with the ministers on the urgency of responding to the city's crisis, and it was in that spirit that they allowed the Black Panther Party to operate a breakfast program from the basement at Grace Episcopal. They were appalled by both the changes in the neighborhood and by the increasing militancy of the Black Power Movement that they demanded that a portrait of Albert Clegg that the artist had painted onto the wall of pride. Um, the vestry demanded that it be covered over with another painting. So what we're actually looking at is um, version two of the wall of pride, and we don't know what version one looked like. Okay. 
um, both of the rectors, Williams and Hunt, were reassigned to other posts away from Grace Episcopal within a few years after the wall was unveiled. Soon after, the congregation ordered that the mural be painted over. And if you go there today, that's what you're going to see, a wall with a big area of black paint. And you can just wonder what's behind that. A woman who was a contemporary of Tanya Blanding recalls feeling pride when she was a little girl at the playground nearby. She recalls seeing pride at seeing black faces looming above the street, then dismay. She was seven years old and she said, where did they go? The faces were painted over first with white paint. And then when they reemerged through the white paint, they were painted over with a darker color. The Harriet Tubman Memorial Wall also drew meaning from its ecclesiastical setting. Walker and Ida were commissioned by Father Tor Thomas Kerwin, a Catholic priest who was a founder of Sessa, to decorate the facade of the Roman Catholic Church across the street from the Wall of Dignity. The artists in this case didn't paint on the brick, they created panels that were fitted into the building's architectural framework and further harmonized them with Gothic arches and outlines that created the effect of stained glass windows. St. Bernard and its um, school across the street were among many religious organizations in transition as white ethnic Catholics left the East Side and congregations integrated. Um, a related process had recently played out with the commissioning of a black Christ painting inside the church of St. Cecilia. At St. Bernard, however, the message was part of the streetscape and conveyed a more pointed political theme. Walker and Ida conceived this wall at St. Bernard's as a means of teaching viewers to consider correspondences between struggles for liberation past and present. Its central panel recasts the Old Testament Exodus to depict a black Egyptian Pharaoh and a dark skinned Moses as what Ida called a brother with a natural. You can see his hair, that was a deliberate choice. Flanking it were images of African American freedom. On the left was Harriet Tubman, kind of an, an angelic version of Harriet Tubman, um, standing amidst a black choir. And on the right, an interdenominational gathering of Black leaders marching forward in the present. This mural, too, provoked a physical response, as public art can do. Late one night, members of the Nation of Islam evidently painted out the figure of Nation of Islam prophet Elijah Muhammad that Walker had originally painted alongside Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And, um, Walker offered to paint it back, but the, um, the Father Kerwin just said, no, leave, at, leave in that painted over area so that people can see all the phases of this mural. Um, thanks in part to the care provided by the church's deacon, this mural actually lasted the longest of the three walls in Detroit. It eventually succumbed to the elements and was removed in the 1980s. And again, we'd love to know what happened to it. Surprisingly, few traces of the murals survived past that time. The building that supported the Wall of Dignity was torn down in the mid 70s. By then, nearly everyone involved in the murals, first the artist Walker and Ida, who were always just visitors from Chicago, then even the clergy from St. Bernard and Reverend Williams and Reverend um, Hunt, they'd all, they all left Detroit within a few years. A few years later, Frank Ditto himself Having expanded his projects in community organizing to include a methadone clinic, a freedom school, and a television talk show, Ditto became exasperated with the slow pace of change in Detroit and he moved away. Evidently, nobody rallied to preserve any of these murals, nor did the neighbors protest their removal, as had happened with the Wall of Respect in Chicago. As we think about the legacy of Detroit's Black Power murals from the 1960s, I can imagine a few different directions. See what you think, um, which of these might be carrying on um, what was proposed at the three Black Power murals. Their legacy might survive in murals by the Detroit artists who had contributed to the Wall of Pride and later received official commissions. 
located not outdoors, but in Detroit's municipal buildings, especially under Detroit's first black mayor, Coleman Young. Lavari Foster's work is featured in the exhibit, and I believe that this mural is still there in the Douglas branch of the Detroit Public Library. And he's not the only one of the people from the Wall of Pride who got commissions to paint in libraries and in other Detroit indoor public spaces. Or we could look for the legacy to a set, another set of murals that were painted on the sides outdoors of commercial buildings in downtown Detroit in the 1970s. They were sponsored through a partnership between the National Endowment for the Arts and New Detroit Inc. So are these the inheritors of the Black Power murals? New Detroit was a coalition of business and civic leaders that in the very same years, the 90, early 70s, were supporting Frank Ditto's projects with the East Side Voice of Independent Detroit. At first glance, the difference between these abstract murals and the Black Power murals would seem to harken back to the debates in the 1960s among Detroit Black artists over figuration and abstraction. These debates are laid out beautifully in Julia Meyer's catalog to the Harold Neal exhibition. Neal and his peers had condemned abstract art as mere stripes and dots. Those, are, those were their words. They thought it was disconnected from black traditions and from the people. But note that many of the creators of the 1970s murals were black artists themselves, sometimes inspired by geometric patterning and African art. And recalled the artist Alvin Loving's comments on the potential of abstraction as a form of black art. And let's look at one of Alvin Loving's murals on the left. He wrote at, at the time this mural was unveiled, I believe that a responsible artist must show what will happen in the world in the future. I believe that in 15 years, the world will either be a much more pleasant place or will be non-existent. He was giving this interview in 1970. The wall is about those two differences between a future that could be non-existent or a future that could be much more pleasant. We can also wonder whether, the, whether Loving and other abstract muralists in Detroit were aware by that time of the vivid abstract public art being created in Harlem on the right by the Smokehouse Associates. They too painted in public. They, did, they transformed vacant lots into playgrounds while making their own mark on inner city New York City. Less officially, another possibility of the legacy of the Black Power murals, traces of the murals remain for many years on walls around Detroit, like here. The owner of a liquor store on Detroit's east side commissioned Benny White, who had helped paint the Wall of Pride, to paint a frieze of heroic portraits. And you can read who they all are. Okay. New portraits of Detroit heroes and sheroes continue to appear on walls around the city to this day. A recent addition to Detroit's mural scene now comes with corporate sponsorship and with it a new set of complications about the idea of public art for the people of Detroit. And this will be our last example. When Fiat Chrysler, which is now Stellantis, sought to expand its facilities on the east side of Detroit, demolition and construction commenced in a neighborhood not far from where the Wall of Dignity and the Harriet Tubman murals had once stood. As part of the community benefits agreement designed to compensate residents there and shield them from the noise, vibrations, fumes, and the visual intrusion of the new plant, a 1,500-foot-long buffer wall has been installed, cutting through the backyards in the neighborhood. What better way, thought the community relations people, what better way to beautify that structure than to propose decorating it with murals? to be chosen through community focused groups and an artist competition. As you can see, the idea has not been a success. Um, as far as I know, it still exists as an artist concept drawing. The wall is there. There may be graffiti, but the murals haven't happened. Um, you can see why in the upper left. Neighbors who considered the compensation money that was offered to them inadequate to repair their homes that were damaged by construction now suspect that the planned mural was an effort to art wash an environmental menace. OK, 
Okay, over 150 Detroit artists have signed a call to boycott the commission. Surprisingly though, and as a way to come back to our original theme of the black power murals in Detroit, um, when the focus groups were held and people brainstormed ideas for what the murals could look like, here are some of the ideas that came up. Dignity, portraits, heroes, Harriet Tubman, black history, ancient history, inspiration, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Aretha Franklin. Sound familiar? Okay. Also ordinary people. It's possible that the people at the focus group remembered the wall of dignity that had once been part of Eastside Detroit. How best to measure the significance of the three long gone murals that aim to make new public images conceivable in a post uprising Detroit. In the years since 1968, neighborhoods surrounding the mural sites have not exactly risen from the ashes of the city's longer history of decline, disinvestment, and environmental injustice, but also survival. Though new housing, sometimes with church support, has been conduct constructed near those sites where the murals originally stood. Um, it makes one wonder if the Black Power murals and all the activities around them helped call attention to the need for housing in those neighborhoods. Beyond brick and mortar, though, is an idea common to much public art, its role in raising consciousness and making visible. In that way, the success of the Black Power murals might have been through their contribution to the culture of Detroit as it emerged as a majority Black city. Those are some of the questions to address as research continues, and I welcome your thoughts. Thank you. So Greg's going to help the people who aren't here ask questions, but maybe the people who are here have questions or would like to go back and look at some of the images. Um, I can also show you that's another set of murals that's now going up in Detroit or did a few years ago that makes you wonder about that idea of portraits of famous people. And um, this was the mural at St. Cecilia that went up just um, months before the murals at St. Bernard went up. And it's part of a long history of imagining Jesus as a black figure. So those were the extras, but yeah. Does anyone have questions? Well, let me go. Um, one thing I'd love to know is if any of these people went, especially the guys from Chicago, went to see the Detroit University Presto. We know that when Walker was in art school in Columbus, Ohio, his teacher had taught Diego Rivera as something that Black artists should know about. But whether they ever made the detour up to the DIA, I would love to know. Um, as for the DIA's outreach, there is a chapter, well, there are chapters in two books that shed light on that. One is a chapter in Jeffrey Aft's book on the history of the DIA. He has two books he wrote. Um, and he describes that during the 1960s, uh, parts of the black community in Detroit approached the DIA and kind of demanded that they expand and create a gallery of African art. And that happened. And it's all in the footnotes, all the minutes and all the letters back and forth. That's in Aft's book. Another piece of the story is in a book called Negro Buildings by Mabel Wilson. And that's a history of African American efforts to create public institutions. And she's got a whole chapter about Detroit. It's not about the DIA. 
It's about the beginning of what became the Charles Wright Museum of African American History. But extra cool was that it began as a portable museum in a trailer that would get hauled to different neighborhoods in Detroit. And from the beginning, it had African art on view. There's another history that we could trace. There were every year or so at the DIA, there'd be a local artist exhibit. And black artists were part of that exhibit, though they noticed sometimes that they were never part of the permanent collection. So there's, there's lots of history to be written. And if any of the students from Nate in Detroit are listening out there, these are research papers to write. <laughs> you know, um, and you could do it through the papers of a couple of organizations. So thanks for the question. Yeah. Clayton. You mentioned that uh, the Walker and Hume were consciously trying to create a black visual aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you can describe what that was like in terms of the style? Yeah. Um, and you know, this is, that little bit kind of got written after some students and I saw the Harold Neal exhibit last week, because let's look at some of their art. I mean, it's a complicated thing to be making lifelike pictures of people and not be drawing upon traditions of European art or Mexican art that also was drawing upon traditions of European art. Um, but Ida eventually works more and more um, this way, where he's trying to look like Egyptian painting. And I don't know, do we have some art history majors here? who can do our art history thing and say what other art might be shouted out to or have inspired this art. I'm thinking that picture with the pyramids in the background looks a little like what Aaron Douglas might have painted during the Harlem Renaissance. So that was part of what was going on here to show that there was an African art heritage and Ida's own style becomes more and more like Egyptian painting. So he had also made um, the portrait of Malcolm X on the wall of dignity. These down here, that doesn't look like Egyptian art at all. That looks like other moments in 20th century art. So that, that was a debate among these artists. Could there be, and it was throughout the Black Arts Movement, could there be a Black art that was not beholden to European art? Or could Black artists draw from European art but go in a new direction? Or the abstract artists would say, let's just make the future now, which is an idea that's still going to be a topic. Yeah. Yeah, that would belong in here. It, does that sound familiar to anyone? The Malik Green or Neil? It's been talked about a lot in light of the focused attention on police killing of Black men in the last few years. Malice Green was a Detroiter, and why he got into an altercation with the police, I'm not sure. Maybe other people know more about that. But he was killed in the course of that altercation with the police. And as so often happens in cities, people, um, people who knew him start making an unofficial shrine where the killing happened. And eventually, Benny White, who had helped out with the Wall of Dignity, you know, the Wall of Pride, 
um, made his own kind of tribute to Mallory's ring on a wall near where Mallory's ring had been built. But that was preserved for a certain amount of time. And then I, was the whole building torn down or just that area of the came it over? That's another challenge. Um, public art is open to graffiti of various kinds. And um, Erica Dawes, who's written on vandalism being part of what defines public art, um, thinks that that's kind of a form of community engagement. But yeah, it must be very tough for the artists. Um, as for what became of the other Detroit artists, I think Julia Myers is out there on Zoom. Um, and she, she'd be the better one to answer that question. Or maybe some people here know. Rebecca, there is a uh, question from uh, Pam. It might have been covered under the uh, conversation about the, uh, the DIA, but uh, she asks or says, uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk, Rebecca, and for these incredible images. I'm struck by the ways in which these murals, especially the walls of dignity, uh, may have worked to create an alternative museum and display space for black Detroit residents who may or may not have been uh, excluded from the DIA. And uh, so was there a sense uh, of a parallel or more accessible version of the DIA created in these murals where Black and African culture and images were displayed and celebrated, or perhaps the creation of an alternate canon? Hmm. Well, I don't know. I guess we've started to answer that question. Um, the thing called the Ghetto Museum kind of indicates that that was possible, and possibly um, Ida painting it. He, he must have had art history books about African art. And he must have been copying that ivory mask and the bronze Benin panel out of art books. And maybe if we spent more time and worked with more experts in African art, they'd be able to craft sources for some of the other African scenes along the top border of the wall of the room. So, yeah, I mean, was that supposed to be a substitute for a museum? It's a really good question. And did the DIA charge admission at that time? I'm not sure they did. But what was it that was um, that made it seem inaccessible? I'm not sure. I'm also not, I mean, I wouldn't swear that public schools weren't taking field trips there and getting black students in that way. I wouldn't swear that it was completely out of reach. But certainly, um, having the murals in these neighborhoods put art in a different place. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, some of them were actually uh, replying directly in to you in the chat. So, uh, actually, uh, Julie uh, 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 Julie Myers actually has a question. Um, was the emphasis on history unique to the Detroit murals, or did it exist in other murals of the Black arts movement? Um, I hate to say unique ever. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. That's a big claim. Um, the Wall of Respect did have a few historical figures, but not many. Mm -hmm. It had mm -hmm. people throughout the arts, throughout sports, to any area of achievement. I think they were mostly living or recently deceased people. Um, the next set was in Boston. You know, it's sometimes it's hard to find what these looked like if they weren't photographed at the time. Sure. But I think that the historical storytelling here was kind of particular and was part of the goal of these two artists working together. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think you've got a question in the rear there.
you know, we do this in our history. If you go to a lecture and we look at one picture and then we think of other pictures, there's great themes, right? And artists are aware of other art. They look at art books and they do a lot of themes. On the other hand, and they read magazines. They read art magazines or NAACP magazines that, or Ebony magazines that would have photo essays. And they learn about art that way. Uh, the Wall of Respect was featured in Ebony magazine. And eventually that um, Black Jesus that saved the king in Detroit was on the cover of Ebony magazine. So that's another way that ideas move around. But in some ways, wall, you know, the murals that Charles White painted for historically black institutions in the South were there. Yeah. They didn't move. So then you wonder, you know, maybe the artists moved. Both Walker and Eva came from the South to get to the Midwest. So it's a good thought. And if you're studying history of histories of black artists and what they could achieve, Charles White would be a stellar example, um, especially for the way he depicted the game. Something else I'd love to research someday, and maybe someone knows about, but it's calendars, art calendars. Certain black organizations, like the Outside Community Art Center in Chicago, published illustrated calendars every year. And people collect, they, were, they had reproductions of art by black artists. And people would have them and put them on the wall. And who knows, maybe even cut their favorite pictures out after that month was done. That might be another way that knowledge about black artists circulated to black art lovers of the um, yeah. Rebecca, one uh, uh, thing that the uh, Zoom audience is asking about is if there is a question from the main audience here, of course, they're not liked. Uh, so uh -huh. they're requesting that you repeat the question uh, because apparently my mic is still picking you up. Sure. Um, is there a particular one we should repeat, or, or they're hearing? No, I've been trying to put it into the text Thank you. Uh, as best I can. But uh, yeah, I think in the future, uh, additional questions would be helpful. I need to talk to more artists. Yeah. Um, some of the mural painters in Detroit now didn't grow up in Detroit, but you know, came to be part of the art scene. Um, but this eventually became so huge, not these particular murals, but the whole movement, especially in Chicago. Walker and Ida went back and they became part of a community mural group that was very good at snagging federal and city funding and painted dozens of murals all over Chicago. And now some of those are being restored. They're so um, much a fixture where they are. Others are on buildings that got knocked down. Um, so heroic black people on walls became an enormous thing. And then meanwhile, out in Los Angeles, a Latina or Chicano Movement was starting with Judith Baca and others, other routes back to Rivera. Um, and eventually there were um, publications about all of this that circulated knowledge. So I don't know, and I'd love to find out. Um, I'll take another question and then I can ask everybody a question, but what's your question? I just wanted to mention that there's this thing that you can see that there's a lot of ways you can was 
a mural I've seen photos of that looks like it was inspired by these, and it doesn't exist anymore. It was called something like the African American Ball of Amalgamation. It was on the side of a community treatment center. And it was all faces, because Coleman Young was there, and the Ren Sen was in the background. So it was a, a little more updated and more Detroit specific. So yeah, they happened. But there were many ways to be to find that idea. So let me ask you, if you were an artist in Detroit, would you want to get anywhere near that philanthropic wall commission? And what could or should go there? I can bring the picture back. I can walk it. Okay. I could go go back to your PowerPoint. Give me a second. There you go. Right now, as far as I know, it's a 1500 foot long wall. <laughs> Not everybody in the neighborhood is angry that Fiat Chrysler is philanthropic has expanded. There is a lot of community outreach to help train people to take jobs in that factory. But just this last week, an environmental complaint was filed by the state because they started painting the jeeps there and the fumes are making it not fit for the purpose of the wall. So, could any art <laughs> improve life in that neighborhood? Let the people think. Yeah. I, I would consider doing it if you have free rent space, maybe even do a mural of architecture or something. But I, it, it seems unlikely to happen. Yeah, visual noise. Um, everybody who owned a house in that neighborhood, of course, didn't, some some took a buyout in that, but some didn't want to leave the house they owned because of their aunt and their father and all. From working in the earlier version of the Chrysler. But when all that construction happened, the houses shook. So there was damage. And sometimes the payout wasn't enough to repay the damage. Is that New construction. Um, that's what people, some people are saying, we've always lived by a factory, what's the sign of it? But others are calling it like Berlin Wall, cutting off one area from another. Yeah, the exterior wall is a factory wall that makes the blank wall. Yeah. I was struck by your corporatization of the wall. And that is a really interesting question, not only in Detroit, but there are a lot of commissions for black artists in Detroit to paint outdoor murals, you know, and indoor murals, like at the Shinola Hotel. Um, and many of the artists who signed the petition saying they would never accept a commission to paint this wall um, are painted on the side of all kinds of businesses in Detroit. 
So, yeah, do we see that as an opportunity for a commission for a picture that would become part of streetscape and inspire people? Or is that seen as somehow making a company look good? It takes money to paint these things. It takes money to maintain them. It takes a month of an artist's time to make such these things. So, yeah, it's a good, it's always this art and money question. Rebecca, can I hold for just one second? I'm going to adjust the audio um, in oh, here. Oh, I the, the, to repeat the question. It's okay. It's okay. We, we'll, 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 let me uh, just see if I can turn the... Okay, can you guys hear us any better? Audience on Zoom? Thumbs up. Thumbs up? Yeah? Okay, all right. Okay, so hopefully that will allow you to hear the questions in the room going forward and we can avoid the feedback that plagued the uh, early part of this lecture. I, I apologize horribly for that. Um, Rebecca, real quick, there was a question that came in that was. Uh, of, of note. Um, this from Stephen uh, M. Ward. Um, Rebecca, do you know of any connections between these murals that you presented and the Black Arts Conferences in Detroit in 1965, 66, and 67, which were called Forum 65, Forum 66, and Forum 67? Um, that uh, apparently these were held at Vaughn's bookstore. Uh, and there were also black arts conventions held at Revler Reverend Clegg's church in 1966 and 1967. Again, this is from Stephen Ward. Stephen, are you still with us? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, thank you for that question. You heard it. <laughs> um, lots of this is described in Julia Myers' catalog to the Harold Mill exhibition. Some of those same artists who worked on the Wall of Pride, um, and Henry King was one, attended those conferences. Okay, interesting. Um, I'd love to know from Stephen Ward where you find the archives of those conferences so that we can learn more about what was discussed there, or at least a program or someone who took notes. If, were they talking about public art as something with potential, or was it a more general discussion of the art? I, I don't know. Okay. Also, the, the back and forth between Chicago and Detroit, I think was evident at those conferences. Many people came from Chicago to present at the conferences in Detroit. Uh, and I think um, the broadside press, the public publisher based in Detroit that published so much poetry by Black um, writers was a present at, presence at those conferences, mm -hmm. and so were Chicago poets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another mystery at the Wall of Dignity. Um, there's an anonymous poem. I, I showed you the quote from a very well-known poem, Calling All Black People, by Leroy Jones, later Baraka. There was a poem lettered on the wall called Slave Ship, that's not the famous poem called Slave Ship. And we don't know who wrote it or who lettered it on the wall. It seems to go with the painting of a slave ship, but it might have been a local Detroit poet. And that would be really interesting to find out. And if you um, write to me, if you'd like me to send you the slide where you can read the whole poem called Slave Ship. Any others out there? Uh, yes. Um, um, Deirdre Diane. Um, Deirdre Spencer. Uh, Deirdre, okay, okay. Uh, um, have any of these murals that currently exist benefited from VIARA, the Visual Artist Rights Act of the US Copyright Law? Whoa. 
a that's great a question about question. public art. Yeah, who owns it and right? Um, who should we be acknowledging for all the photography in this talk, among other things? Um, I don't think Walker and Ida were paid very well. They were paid. Um, I think they were paid for probably a smaller project than what it turned into. And Jeff Hubner's book, that's a biography of William Walker, has a lot of detail. Like they drove back and forth from Chicago to Detroit in Ida's VW bus. And they made a lot of trips. And sometimes there'd be paintings in the back of the bus. Um, so who owns the art? I wish I knew. What do you think? A, a lot of the art wasn't signed. Mm -hmm. which also makes it kind of hard to figure out who did what in the group mural. Who should own the art or is it the people's art? Um, and maybe Deirdre knows of examples where yeah, artists um, were able to copyright um, if, and somehow maintain control. Deirdre, it seems like she might have something to say. I'm going to try to unmute you. Is that OK, Deirdre? Sure, yeah. Let's She's if a I fine can. arts librarian at U of Michigan, so she deals with art yeah. and copyright all the time. Oh, we don't hear you. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, I see. I see what's happening. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Uh, ooh, okay, the space aliens. Um, yeah. I know that with the copyright, with, with VARA, you know, the artists have the right to argue for the defense of their works of art in public places like that. Uh, what I was sort of thinking, I was thinking more of the destruction of the murals mm -hmm. and that um, in certain places and times, the owners of the buildings and the walls have had, have gone to court and battled with the artist, you know, over Vara. But um, I'm thinking that um, as you were saying, we don't even know who all the artists are. So the, in some of the cases, so that might make, make it difficult to try to um, you know, argue in court that the, the work has a right to remain and that copyright protection does. I mean, copyright protection belongs to the artist, but if you don't know who that artist is, you know, um, but it seems as if, Oh, yeah. And I had also had a question about the National Conference of Artists, too. I'm sorry. I had written that to Stephen Ward. And I'm thinking that the National Conference of Artists probably predated these murals. Is that do you think? Sorry to go off on two tangents. Julia. Um, well, if you come to the, the uh, closing reception on Sunday, Shirley Woodson will be there and you could ask her. Uh, because she was one of the founders. I know that, you know, I, I wrote this a long time ago, so I'm trying to you know, remember. Um, she, Evan Purry Pitts and John Lockard went mm -hmm. to some NCA meetings in Chicago, 68, I think. Wait, I might be getting this mixed up, but the actual NCA, the Detroit branch of the NCA didn't really start till 74. Okay. But they were involved with the national group before that. I think John Lockard served as their publicity. Person. Yeah, he was, uh, I think he might've been chair. I think he chaired it one year. Yeah. Over at one point. I'm pretty sure he did. Yeah. The so president. Three people were involved with the NCA early on before. It took them a while to get the Detroit chapter going. Mm -hmm. I was thinking they could, that could have been a source of information about uh, any sort of uh, questions people might have had about the creation of the murals and just any other uh, details, superfluous or otherwise. It could be a source of information. But um, you know, you know, I'm also thinking maybe Black, maybe the Chronicle could also, like Rebecca had looked at the Chronicle and had some information from there. You know, whoever's writing about the art at the time, you know, in whatever 
you know, even if it's not just about an art, it's not an artistic publication, but if it's a community publication, you know. Well, um, um, my students and I went through about 30 years of the Chronicle. So we mm. got a lot of great information out of that. Good. That really good. one of the major sources for the catalog. Yeah, good. I think I still have the live guide I made for your class years ago. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, Rebecca. Yeah, sorry. No, but you're answering the questions and you're adding to the information. That's great. Um, so uh, no, I think, I think that's about it. Um, Stephen does say thank you so much for, for doing such a lovely presentation. And I think he, he and you sound like you will be in touch. I hope uh, so. Yeah. 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 Stephen's done so much work on mm. James and Grace and Bob, mm. who were also active on the East Side. So it would be, and had a great vision for what the arts could do in a city. So it would be fascinating to know if there were any threads connecting this story. Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I was just thinking if the, if Yeah, and that's a, a really important point of how involved was the community in these so-called community murals and how much was it kind of a traditional idea of the artist being the one who has the skill and the vision and the talents and the story he often he wants to tell coming in to kind of give a gift to the community. I think there was quite a bit of the latter, but when Walker went back to Chicago, where he was all along, and as the Chicago mural group gets going, they kind of switched up a paradigm for making murals in communities. And what they ended up doing is not what had happened in Detroit. There would be meetings with the artists and with community groups. And the community groups could suggest subjects but then once the artist got started, no more comments. <laughs> um, another way the community could get involved was by helping out, um, by carrying paint and building scaffolding. And that kind of thing did happen. And if you read the Ghetto Speaks, there's a little article on a carpenter who was especially helpful in getting the panel up on the wall and making it all stand up. But right, in some ways, there could be a model of community engagement that was not happening here. And who knows, maybe if there had been more community engagement, uh, you might have seen one of the old photos of the Wall of Dignity shows that it was tagged. There's a big splotch of dripping paint on it, which might have been part of gang activity in the area. Um, so yeah, one always wonders. But could there be a mural that was so loved by everybody that they'd all help keep it there? Evidently not the best street. So it would be great. I mean, I've talked to Reverend Williams, who left Grace Episcopal you know, after only a few years and hasn't been back. It would be great to talk to people who were young people at church school then and find out who they grew up to be and what they remember of all this. Or maybe. There'll be people who are members of the congregation saying, you know, he got us all wrong. We really wish Malcolm X up there. Mm -hmm. uh, or no, they got Malcolm X. We really wanted Albert Plague up there. Okay. Well, any, there's 
that's it. Um, I guess, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, okay. like, At some point, Susan should be talking to Benny White, so I'd like to find out a little more from you about how to get hold of him. Maybe not right now. Uh, okay. Not everyone's on email. I guess my other question to you is what, what could this project turn into if I were to turn it into something? that I could work on with students? Could it be an exhibition or, yeah, what could it, could it be a new mural? What do people think? Yeah. Nothing has changed from these original murals. I mean, in all reality, we're still dealing with the same problems. Uh, so it's just a new mural, but the irony of all of this is that really I mean, a lot of stuff that they were talking about in the late 60s is still doing, we're still doing Right now, and which is a terrible irony of our culture. Um, so whatever it is, uh, something that we need to remind ourselves about. Remind ourselves of these, or start thinking about what needs to go into a mural now. I mean, that's another question. Understanding our history first. Levi Foster painted a mural for Cass Tech. I don't know if it's still there. Oh, I, don't. I don't know if it's still there. That's a really good point, though. Thank you. So if anyone wants to email, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There was Plus, I enjoyed your choice of talk. I'm very much interested in all of the all of the Detroit Park history. I'm working on the podcast. I teach a college. I'm going to interview you on the podcast about the Detroit.